It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Wednesday, June 21st. Your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is very curious about how these RFA contracts are going to turn out. Yeah, it should be uh, interesting. We're going to talk about who might get what. Plus, we're in a burnt orange state of mind, I guess, with these new jerseys. Plus, your mailbag questions all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who is on Twitter at Sportsology. This episode is brought to be brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. You can subscribe or follow Locked On Flyers for free over on YouTube or on the Sirius XM app. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, you'll get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Russ, uh, much like we talked about on yesterday's show, the Flyers did indeed release their new jerseys for this upcoming season. And I got to say, man, the Flyers are so good at this. I mean, whether or not you like the jerseys, the presentation, the videos, the descriptions, like everything they do is just so quality. Yeah, they do a good job. I mean, was I a little surprised it was Owen Tippett in the video? Yeah, I admit I, I was a little surprised. Uh, I think while the Flyers are trying to find their identity, they're also trying to find the identity through the players. I think that's uh, something that's sort of noticeable with guys that they've chosen and everything else. But as far as the presentation, it's, it's, it's top notch. And I like the jersey. I have no qualms about it. It does remind me of the Lindros era, which is kind of like what we were thinking, but I'm not a Jersey expert. The only thing is we all probably wish the IBX wasn't purple or whatever that is blue, but like they get a choice sponsor, you know? Yeah. I think that's kind of the point. Like if you pay to put your logo on a Jersey, it has to stand out. So if it blends in, what are you paying for? So I get it. It, It's annoying, but also I get it. Um, But I think your point about, you know, who they're putting in the Jersey was a good one. Uh, yeah, Tippett in the jersey in the video. And then in the still pictures, they had Faraby, Sanheim, and Delorier uh, as the models of the three different versions. Uh, all very interesting choices. Yeah, like there's no Carter Hart. There's no Sean Couturier. So it's like, you know, but whatever. Not my, not my team to worry yeah. about. That. But I do like what they did as far as how everything looks. It all looks great. Yeah, I think so, too. And again, you know, there's nods to the past, but it's a little different. And and as we predicted, some people love it and some people hate it. And that's how it was. That was always how it was going to be. And uh, I am looking forward to actually seeing how they look on the ice, because to me, like whether or not the numbers are readable and all of that is what's most important. I will uh, say this, though. I do have to add that if it were my team, Carter Hart would be in the ad. I get why you might be worried about Couturier, but Carter Hart would be in the ad. Yeah, I don't know. Could be an availability thing, too. Uh-huh. So uh, we'll we'll see what's going on there. But um, I think that uh, moving on to our RFA discussion, uh, Brandon wrote to us that uh, we mentioned this last week in our mailbag segment uh, with the question about the RFAs and who they might uh, give what kind of offers to. And we said we were going to do a whole episode on that. And that is today. So I want to begin with Noah Cates and Morgan Frost and their deals, because I feel like the two of them in some ways are in similar boats and could be competing against each other in some ways in terms of the type of contract they might get. Now, they are very different players, but in terms of you're looking how many years of the deal, what the cap hit might be, do you want to stagger their deals? And all of this is, you know, if you're considering them as part of the Flyers' future, how their deals need to fit into the timeline of the rebuild. So t- staggering when they expire, so you're not having to pay a bunch of the same guys like the same year and on all their salaries go up at once. So I think like, to me, Noah Cates and Morgan Frost, like their fortunes are inextricably tied together. I think they are. I think that's really um, 
smart that the way you said that. And this is a tough one because it's like, I don't think I would offer five or six years to either. I think it's too soon. I think there's too many long-term contracts on the team. And again, if it were my team, I'd be like, you know what? We're going to offer you four at this number. And right now that's like company policy. Like we're not doing anything more than that. So don't worry. Like next year, I'm not going to go out and give more than four to somebody else. This is just what we're giving. And for you, it gives you a chance to prove yourself. And if you do, guess what? You're going to make more on the second end of it. So it does kind of help both, both, you know, sides. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when you're looking at these contracts, I mean, I think, you know, the default thing to do would be to offer them both two year deals. Right. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can do that with these two. I think one of them at least has to get more term on this contract. And I think four years is, is smart. They may have to settle on five or six just to get a deal done. But I think four is the smart uh, spot to start at. But I do think that in a, a two-year deal environment, they would get similar deals in the two to 2.5 million per year deal. But I think if one of them signs a longer deal that's four to five years, they're going to have to ask for more money. And they're going to get in the $4 million range just because it goes further into their career. And um, they're going to want that security. And uh, so I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's fine. I just think you're going to have to pick one of those two to bet on in that way. And um, I think that would be a tough choice, given that um, both of them could end up being your three C long term, if you think about it. Right. No, they both could. I'm looking at the contract that was given um, a couple of years ago to Connor Brown. It was like three years, 10.8 average salary, 3.6. I think that's right in the range to offer really both of them. And you know, if one of them says, I got to have a little more, or the team says, we like this one a little more, fine. Then you get like 3.8 and you get 3.6 and we'll do that over four years, something like that. I think I would fall short of four though, if I could, because again, the savings could be really good on that in the sense that if I get them both to go like three, six, three, seven, something like that, then, you know, I'm saving another, I don't know what, half million dollars every year, which could come in handy rather than just going four. Because like, like that was a problem with the Fletcher era is he would just go top of the market value for a guy just to retain him. And, you know, that's not working out for him. So now I wouldn't do top of the market value. I'd be like, hey, uh, if you keep playing here and you like this team and we like you, let's come to an agreement that works for both of us. Yeah, well, where I think the issue is, is that I think Noah Cates has less leverage here just because he had fewer points and he hasn't proven himself on the board yet. And so to me, if one of these two guys are going to get that bigger deal, it's going to be Morgan Frost, just because I think if you look at his progression this past year and the fact that he had more points. And he's more um, time served, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's likely where they'll end up going and then give Noah Cates a two year 2.5 contract. Um, That's more of a bridge deal, but you know, it could go up to four years, but it wouldn't like the value wouldn't be as high. Right. Um, But unfortunately I do think they're probably pretty similar in value, right? Yeah. They're pretty similar in value. I think we're talking about the same things. I think Frost does have to make more, like you said, because of time served and yeah, I mean, there's no reason that they can't keep them both. And then there's no reason that in three, four years, they may not have either one. Like you Mm -hmm. just don't know, like, you know, expectations are expectations like you know you're going to hope that frost even improves on this year and gets over the 50 point mark and if he does then he definitely has really good value in this league as a center over 50 points like now you're talking that's that's pretty good value there right because lawton makes three Mm -hmm. but Lawton had a career year and he had that contract a few years ago so everything's sort of in line contract wise in what we're talking about yeah, I think so too. And I, I think it, it is going to be a tough decision for the Flyers in terms of of who to give that slightly better offer to here. But I do think that there's a possibility that the Flyers don't have both of them when they hit kind of the stride of this rebuild. Yeah, I mean, um, that's just the way it is because Cutter Gauthier will be there. Whoever you get this year in the draft will mm-hmm. be there. At least one of them, you say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you have to plan for that. Like, that's that's why you have to sort of look at this and say, okay, this is us. What are we going to be in four years? We're going to guess now what the cap's going to be. 
but let's sort of guess who we feel is going to be there. And I would have you, I would call you to make the spreadsheet and you make the <laughs> spreadsheet and have the salaries and, and, you know, and fill in the blanks and it might change, but to me, I got to have some sort of roadmap. And it didn't seem yep. like the players had a roadmap before. They were just kind of doing it willy nilly. Yeah, I, I think there's some truth to that. And, you know, for me, I would make sure that these two deals in particular are staggered in terms of their expiration so yes. that not only are you not negotiating with them in the same year, but also if you're considering trading them at deadline, you're not doing that in the same year as well. Right. No, it's good. That would be smart. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got more guys to talk about, including another guy potentially in that same tier in Cam York and then a couple other guys as well. And we will do that coming up next. Baseball season's in full swing, and there's no better place to get on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back on bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. I'll tell you, a, a good bet, uh, the Mets are playing the Astros. They won the first game in that series. Uh, they're the underdog. Maybe keep going with the underdog, and maybe the Astros um, are going to go on a little bit of a losing streak. You can make some money. Don't miss your chance to snag a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission. All right, so getting into our next batch of RFAs, starting with Cam York. And I feel like in some ways, York is in the same bucket as Noah Cates and Morgan Frost, just in terms of development and status within the team. Uh, but because he's a defenseman, I feel like you can separate him mm -hmm. in the conversation in that way. Um, and to me, I feel like Cam York has a lot of leverage right now in the sense that he has been playing top pairing minutes uh, this past season. His progression was right on target uh, to what they asked him to do. He still isn't producing, I think, the way that they want yet. No. But at the same time, he really did make a, a good adjustment to the NHL level. And he, like I said, he was carrying those minutes. And with them trading Ivan Provorov, they're going to depend on Cam York a lot more this season. And so... You know, I, I feel like with him, um, you may have to give him more than that automatic two-year bridge deal here. No, you're going to have to give him four or five. Um, I think the agent, if he's smart, will say, hey, look, you had my guy playing his offside. He did it like a good soldier all year. Maybe, it, you know, it, it was harder for him offensively this year, but the offense will come. Now you're going to make him a 20-point, 20 20-minute-a-guy 20 game because he was like 19 last year. And so based on that, yeah, guys who do this get this. And now he's the guy that's going to get 4 million bucks because now he's, you know, they're turned him into a second pairing defenseman. And if he's a 20 minute guy, you know, he's going to get right around 4 million bucks. It might be like four by four. Yeah. And I think that's really the smart way to go here is that you give him that four by four deal and you kind of look at, um, a lot of defensemen, I think, I think the Flyers did that with Travis Sanheim too, right? Where they, it yep. was like this step up yes. kind of path. And, you know, there's an upside and a downside to doing that in terms of you get like a little bit of value early on, but then you're really going to have to pay and mm -hmm. you're, you're going to, you're going to get, you know, a situation where you might have to sign him to like a seven year deal a little bit older than you would otherwise. And so the number of years at then, a value that you're going to get might be a little bit less, but I think that with him, that's the kind of path you, you almost are forced into doing here um, with him and that um, he is going to have to earn a, a lot of, you know, the respect and the, the minutes and, and all of that. And he should get paid for it. Like, honestly. Yeah, no question. Uh, I think the way that you have to look at it is, like everybody talks about the cap going up. I think it will go up too. I don't know if it'll go up the way everybody's saying because there are other things that could mitigate um, gate-driven revenue next year, right? But the cap's going to keep going up. So you're betting against the cap going up and that it will keep going up so it's not as big of a strain. You're also betting on him that he's going to do better. And you're also betting on as the team does better, we're going to get more fans back and the organization's going to make more money as a result. 
those are the kind of things that you're gambling against, but I think it's a good gamble. Yeah, I think so too. And and that's why, you know, your four by four deal sounds just about right for Cam York right now. Um, but, you know, we'll see what the Flyers do. And with, uh, with all of that, there are some other guys we have to talk about as well who received qualifying offers last week, and that's Ronnie Adderd and Ali Lixel. And to me, these are guys in a, a tier below the ones we've mm-hmm. talked about already. And in most cases, you would see these guys get a one or two year deal for like 1 million or like between 800,000 and 1 million. And I kind of see that's where it's going. Now, the trend has been recently to give guys like this two year deals, right. uh, like two year contract seems to be the thing. But again, I just get concerned with the lack of of staggering in all these deals and and so you can't control it all though i get what you're i know no i know it is a difficult business it just is yeah i'm just wondering if adder gets a two-year deal and ollie lixel gets a one-year deal i think that's the way you have to go with this because defensemen are worth more and Mm -hmm. at some point in these two years let's say adder does become faster right well, then he's going to make the NHL. Like, that's the one thing that's sort of holding him back. If all of a sudden he's faster, well, now he's up in the NHL. Now he's helping out my power play. Now he's maybe starting out as a third-pairing defenseman, but maybe he could do more uh, by the year two of this deal. So that's the way I'm looking at it. Like, you know, Adder's got this offensive upside besides, you know, being a guy who's physical and really just needs the speed. Lixel, look, I think if they give him a chance, there's a chance he could put it together. Because we see that he's got these abilities, but he just yeah. hasn't been able to put it together. And I think if the coaching staff kind of goes with more set lines this year and let him become like a line, you know, real part of a line, whether it be the third line, hopefully, um, at some point, but even if it's the fourth, whatever, um, that you'll see something out of him. But again, if you're only putting him out there for five minutes a game, you're not going to get much. So I just feel like they have less invested in Lixel right now as an organization, whether that's good or bad, I just feel like that's the way it is. Yeah. I do think that with Lixol, it, it is a, a very much a prove it year for him. Um, and so that's why I see them, you know, only giving him a one year deal. But I think as part of that, they, you're right. They do have to give him enough minutes and the right kind of minutes for him to be able to prove what he can do. Cause I just don't want him to be in a situation where he's not even given the chance to earn another deal after right. that. Right. Cause there is ability there. Maybe we're going to find out it's quadruple A ability over time, but you need to find that out. And I think this is the year you find that out. Yeah. And then, you know, you're right with, with Ronnie Adderd on the defensemen are worth a little bit more uh, side of things. And, and I do think that his upside as a defenseman is really strong. And I, I think that, you know, he could be a really strong contributor to the Flyers blue line for a number of years, especially, you know, again, you you look at his flexibility in terms of who he can be partnered with and he can fit in almost anywhere. I mean, you wouldn't put him on a top pairing unless you were really had to. But right. at the same time, I feel like he can balance his game really well to who's, whoever he's partnered with. Um, he loves getting involved offensively. I love his shot. Um, you know, that's something that's been missing from the Flyers for a while now is a defenseman with a decent shot. I mean, yeah, that's what Tony D'Angelo was for, but clearly that is not his forte. So, right. um, yeah, I mean, it kind of used to be, but you're right. It hasn't turned out that way. Uh, yeah, I think here's here's what happens. It's always like a domino effect. So if Adam mm-hmm. does well and he gets this extra speed, he comes up, he's a right hand shot. All of a sudden he's playing the right side, maybe on the second pair. Now, all of a sudden, Cam York can play his strong side. On, on the left side, and whether it's on the top pair, second pair, however you decide, um, that's what you'll decide down the road, you know, and him and Sanheim will be fighting for a spot then. But, like, that's what it, it could, you know, that's the kind of thing that it could help. And that might take a year. Like, you might just come up and say, all right, the easiest thing is to put him on the third pair, and that's what we're going to do. Okay, that's fine. But at some point, you know, you might get York on his strong side again. If that's the long-range plan, then he's the guy that gets him out of that. Yeah, I think so too. And so that's where I'm kind of, you know, looking to give Ronnie Adder that extra boost of confidence by giving him those two years in order to accomplish what he needs to. And I think that will help and and will go a long way. Um, Certainly going to be interesting to see how these contracts 
uh, play out, whether it's for the forwards or the defensemen. But um, I think that there's a lot of um, hard math <laughs> ahead for Danny Breer's group there. In the meantime, we have a whole bunch of your mailbag questions to answer, and we will do that coming up next. All right. Uh, like I said, we're getting some really good questions over on YouTube, which dominate kind of the question pool today. Uh, Mike Roberts wanted to know if Sean Walker is another ghost. No, because I mean, Sean could. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he he's not another ghost because he doesn't have the same kind of shot. I yeah. mean that's that's the big de that's the big difference. Uh, ghost has that massive shot that was evident the minute we all finally really saw him. And so, no, he doesn't have that. Could he be like as far as puck moving and skating similar? Yes. Yeah, I think so. And you know, he's going to be the one that progresses the play a little bit more for the flyers and whereas i i think ghost would have you know held on to the puck a little bit because he he does have that shot and he was going to take the shot uh walker's going to dish it off to the to the right person to actually take the one shot. thing that gossip spear and walker have in common is neither are physical that's true <laughs> that is very true but I, again i i think you know we'll have a, a solid serviceable defenseman in sean walker yeah. for for this upcoming season uh, Nolo on YouTube asks, Rustin, Rachel, why do you think teams keep doing the same mistake of signing players at the end of their 20s or past it to very long-term contracts? I'd like your opinion on this. It's the same circus over and over again. It seems like GMs never learn. Well, the system's kind of made that way. Like, I think the only thing that would change that is if all of a sudden you had an older draft age. Like, all of a sudden, hey, it's a 19-year-old draft now. And so now players, you know, you're getting them at a different age. You get a better look at them. Uh, I think if that were the case, then you might be getting these longer term deals on guys like a year older, but you'd have a better idea what they are. As far as, you know, doing them, it's easy to shoot it down. But the problem is most GMs are under the same situation where, uh, you got to keep who you think your core guys are. And and the best way to keep the AAB down is with extra years. Sometimes you are saying, yep. all right, maybe they're not going to be great in that in that last year, uh, depending on what age you're signing them at. But it kind of is a trap in the way that it's set up in the league. I don't really blame the GMs for it. No, I don't either. I think that if you want to secure your top guys, because if you're talking about your late 20s, right? That's your your peak for a lot of guys in the league. And so if you want to secure that guy for maybe that three to four year window of a player at their top performance, you have to give them income security for an additional three years in, in order to, yeah. to get that. And, and with the way the cap works and spreading out the AAV in terms of being, it being different than the actual salary paid out uh, by year, which could different could be different and with bonuses and all of that. But that's like kind of how the system works in terms of if you want to buy a guy's services for the top three to four years of their career, well, you have to make sure they're comfortable for further in their life. And yeah. that's how sports work. Yeah. I think there would be less guessing if, if you did draft older players, because then I think by the time mm -hmm. you got them two years later at 21, you have a really good idea what they are. And then after they're done with their ELC, guess what? You don't need to bridge them at that point. And then no. you won't be complaining about guys that they signed in their late 20s because you could even see how good they are. It really would make a difference. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering how that would change the trade market too. Like, in turn, because if you're locking guys down at age 21 for seven to eight years, like that changes the whole ball game in terms of trades. Yeah, that's a very interesting concept we might have to do an episode about that just yeah. as a whole and what the effects would be later down the road so uh, stay tuned for that it's a really good question though because it sure. is just a, a systemic kind of issue um kenjo wants to know does tk get traded to ottawa or edmonton if at all this off season i think there's a marginal chance my whole thing is if you're trading with a team to get a late first round pick and you're not getting much else don't trade them like, even in this draft, don't do it. You already have two picks in this draft. 
Um, I wouldn't do it for that. Now, if I'm getting a second in this draft and a top prospect, one that in a year or two could play in the NHL, then I'll consider it. But if I'm just getting like a first and a second, a first this year, a second next year, I'm not doing it. Like at some point, the Flyers do have to get players too. Yeah. Because, you know, like they, they need to put a team out there on the ice. Right. And everybody wants picks. But when you're getting picks and you see how long that these picks are going to take, you know, you can't go picks route for everybody that you trade. You can't. Yeah, I do think that in the case of Travis Konechny, you do need to get a top prospect in return yes. as part of the package. And I think and a second makes sense if it's a high second. Yeah. Um, you know, especially if, if you are getting one of the top prospects in somebody's system. Right. I think that's you know, top two, top three at the worst. The top, they think he's the guy. That's what I'm looking for. Yep. I think so as well. Uh, one more question. Do the Flyers make any more deals before the draft? They'll be talked about. I could see maybe one more deal. But if it's one more deal, again, it's going to be they're going to try and get a first or they're going to try and um, get a second that they're missing. But I don't put a lot of chance on that. Like, I think it's 30%. I think what there's more of a chance of is if they're trying to like turn 22 into like 17 or something, because there's a player they want and then they might have to trade like, you know, a third from next year and something else from this year or fourth from this year, whatever, and give it to a team. I could see them doing that because if, if they feel like there's a guy out there that really fits their plan of what they're mm -hmm. doing moving forward, I think showing yourself to be aggressive in this draft would be good for the fans too. Yeah. I mean, I don't see them trading any other players unless they can magically figure something out for Kevin Hayes. I think that's the right. only circumstance that, that might change things um, because he's very clearly on the trading block oh, right yeah. now. Um, but it's everybody else trading block. Yeah. Everybody else I think is a, a question mark. And so that might wait until after the draft. Uh, or at the draft itself to play out. Um, that will do it for our mailbag. And once again, thanks to all of you subscribed over at YouTube. We're getting closer to our next giveaway and hopefully we can announce what that will be early next week if you get us closer to the 900 sub mark. So make sure you are subscribed to us over on YouTube as well. Uh, everyday listeners, tomorrow on the show, we're going to have more versus conversation for the draft. We're going to look at the 22nd overall pick. Uh, one of the verses we're going to look at is Riley Height versus Braden Yeager, which should be really interesting. We've talked oh. about Yeager before on the show, but not as much height. So should be a really good conversation. We'll have another versus as well. If you want your question answered on the show, you can tweet us at Lockdown Flyers. You can email us at Lockdown Flyers at Gmail. Or you can comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Have a great day, everyone.